Hey, everybody. I got a speaking mic. So something a little new for today's video. I decided to set up the mic that I normally use on my snare drum. So um, today I'm doing this video and it is related to Led Zeppelin's second album. Some of you may have seen the last video that I did that was covering the debut album. It's basically the same format. I just want to talk a bit about the album, the recording of the album, and a little bit of the history of the, that time period in their career, and then do some demos of each song and break down um, what Bonzo was playing and, and why it's um, so iconic and why it's just you know so great and distinctive what he did to make these songs have such a, a personalized sound and, and beat. So two was mostly recorded in several studios. I'm not sure if there was one studio in particular because I'm not really a historian about the whole recording process, but um, I know they recorded some of it early on at Olympic Studios in London, and Jimmy had just gotten his Les Paul number no. one, which became his favorite guitar from Joe Walsh, and uh, that was, I think, sometime during the first tour around February of 1969. And um, you can see in some photos, I think they're from Olympic Studios, Jimmy's got the Les Paul. So he had the Les Paul before he came to the U.S. late in uh, April of 69. They started their second tour like around the last week of April, I believe on the West Coast. They had already started recording some of the album. I'm not sure which tunes, but... Most of the album was recorded and overdubs and mixing and all of that stuff was done while on the road, while touring um, during April, I guess, through maybe August of 69. Um, they had a couple different tours that they did throughout the spring and the summer. And some of it was recorded on the East Coast in New York, like at A and, what's that, A and R Studios? Is that right? Uh, there was a place called Juggy Sound. I remember seeing that that name. Uh, and then on the West Coast, they were at, uh, I think it's A&M on the West Coast. That later became the Jim Henson Studios. Um, Mystic Sound in L.A. They also did some recording, I think, up in Vancouver and in Memphis. Uh, so, you know, a lot of different locations. It was kind of a patchwork album that they put together while on the go and given that fact I think the album really has a, a very solid consistency of sound even though you can kind of tell that you know different studios were involved especially with the drum sound overall it does sound like you know a complete album it doesn't sound like a compilation of things that were recorded in different studios too much and Bonzo was using his maple thermal gloss kit so I decided to set up the the old the old maple kit here and um and do the demos on it and i'll also do that for the uh the third album as well and there's some photographs of bonzo in the studio not many but there's some you may have seen i'll, I'll post some here during the course of this video as well there's some photos of him putting a symbol on a stand I think it's on this stand and he's holding a symbol and Terry and I have talked about like what is that symbol because you know we can't really see labels or stamps or anything I thought it looks a lot like a crash like a Zildjian crash an 18 inch crash and and Terry or, or maybe a 602 and Terry's like no I think that's a 602 you know that he's holding but then when you see it on the stand there's a shot from the side and the bell looks larger to me than a 602 bell it looks a lot like a zildjian you know typical zildjian bell from uh from that era and there are times in 69 where you see he has two symbols on this side he's got a 16 which he often used here in 69 and then he's got an 18 over here and the 18 looks like that same symbol to me that's over here. It's, a, it's got a larger bell. It looks like, a, like an 18-inch A Zildjian crash. So anyway, who knows? Um, there's no clear photos of his symbols that show giant beat stamps or if it's a 602 or anything. But my gut feeling is that he was using 602s a lot, especially after the mid-summer 
of 69 when they played in Chicago. And he could have possibly got a bunch of 602s from the Ludwig, Ludwig factory, which is here in Chicago at that time. Because there are photos of him playing in Chicago and there's some pictures of him. He's standing on the, on the drum seat and those symbols look like brand new 602s. They look like shiny and clean and like they have just came out of the bags. So the album was, the second album was being recorded during that time. So he may have had a mix of stuff. So as far as the gear goes, it's really hard to know, but we do know that he was um, playing the Maple Thermal Gloss kit based on those photos. There are also some photos of him, I think, recording Moby Dick, where he's got like a leather, brown leather hat on, and um, it's a four-piece. You don't see in it the, uh, the extra 16 floor tom. He's got an 18 floor tom here. And... Um, there's a, mics everywhere, and there's also a couple photos from from Olympic, I think it is, and Jimmy's recording, I think, Ramble On. He's got his acoustic, and you can see Bonzo's bass drum, and you can see a shadow that looks like um, the same shadow you can see in my bass drum with the newspaper. I have shredded newspaper in my bass drum, but Bonzo likely had some crumpled newspaper, and you can see that shadow that looks like crumpled newspaper in the bottom of the bass drum, so... I'll post that picture here right now so you can see that. So anyway, um, I'm going to get into doing demos and talking about each tune, starting with Whole Lot of Love. But before I do that, I just want to say that this album, I think, is like every Zeppelin album, really. It's it's special uh, for for a reason. And in this case, I think after the smash success of the first album and and what I mean by that is not just necessarily I don't necessarily mean in terms of sales but just in terms of how it woke up the whole music world like the the freshness of that album now the second album uh comes along and it's very much a hard blues type record I mean it's definitely heavy on the blues content you got heartbreaker you've got the lemon song which is a Howlin' Wolf, uh, basically, version of Killin' Floor. It's got a whole lot of love, which is steeped in the blues. But it also starts to uh, point to Zeppelin's future light and shade kind of um, philosophy about uh, songwriting, where you have a slower or quieter passage um, or a couple verses, and then heavier, louder, more aggressive verses that contrast so you have this light and shade kind of ethos and that was found on the first album really in Babe I'm Gonna Leave You which uh, had those juxtapositions within the structure of the song but on the second album you've got Ramble On which has that kind of structure what is and what should never be and um, Thank You as well which also contrasts between light and shade to me it's a pretty uniform sounding album even though it was recorded in so many different studios it still sounds like a really complete work so i'm gonna start talking a little bit about whole lot of love and do some demonstrations of the drumming on each song and talk about what he was doing there so the, the very first notes that you hear from john bonham on led zeppelin 2 are this That's how he makes his entrance, and immediately you feel that the beat has got some sort of extra funkiness and grooviness to it. It's not a real straight eighth note kind of rock beat. It's got a lot of bounce. So there are isolated drum tracks for four songs, um, and guitar and bass and, and vocal as well, but for four songs on the album, we're fortunate to have isolated tracks. And when you listen to the isolated drum tracks for these four songs, you can really hear the swing that's just inherent in Bonzo's grooves and in his fills. So when I talk about swing, we've talked about this before, but swing doesn't just mean like taking eighth notes and turning them into triplets with a rest or uh, dotted eighth notes with sixteenth notes like... 
you know, that's not really swing. I mean, swing has to do with a sort of like dynamic or a tension and release that isn't real strictly within like straight 16th notes or eighth notes or quarter notes. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a way of breathing uh, in a phrase. So um, let's see if I want to get too technical about this, but it's almost as if the beat is more rooted in triplets than it is in eighth notes. So for example, the beat that he plays on Whole Lot of Love is this. Okay, now you can hear that in that beat, it's not. It may sound really similar, really close, because that's what the same, the notes are. But the way the notes are being played, there's a swagger, there's a kind of just a looseness about it. And, you know, the whole Zeppelin phrase of uh, the famous tight but loose phrase, that's to me exactly, that embodies Bonzo's style of drumming. And Whole lot of Love is the perfect example of the tight but loose style. I mean, it's got a really tight, funky backbeat, but it also has this loose kind of swagger or sway within the beat. Now, you can hear when he plays his fills, they have a little bit of that almost triplet feeling. So like... So in other words, those eighth notes are not, or sixteenth notes, are not strictly... They've got a little bit more of a... Hopefully you can hear the difference between that. Now, if I exaggerate the difference, it would be the difference between and. But that's exaggerated, and that can sound corny if you lean too heavily on, you know, tightening up those, those uh, the distance between those notes or sp and spacing them out. So the first section, you've got this funky beat, that is not, like, I, w I would think most drummers would have played, you know, um, this kind of beat. <laughs> but not Bonzo. Bonzo plays with the riff of the song, which is what he often does. So the riff is... So right there... He's playing along with the rhythm by breaking up the bass drum and the snare part so that it gets staggered like this. Now, that beat is really similar, um, excuse me, to custard pie but it's flipped. Custard pie is flipped. It's sort of like an inverted or a mirrored version of Whole Lot of Love. This custard pie is this. Oh, uh, sorry. Whole Lot of Love. Custard pie. And I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but custard pie also has that lightly swung feeling. It's not real strict, stiff, up and down. And this is what a lot of drummers, I think, get wrong if they're trying to sound like John Bonham or if they're playing Zeppelin covers and it just doesn't feel good for some reason. It feels like, you know, almost like a heavy metal approach to playing Zeppelin. Zeppelin is all about funk and soul and R&B and that feeling in the music. So whole lot of love really has that. So um, not to spend too much time on just this one song, uh, but it is the m most involved in some ways in terms of the drums because after this section, it goes into the breakdown. Bonzo's just keeping time with his hi-hat, and there's all this electronic stuff happening, swirling around. And there's quite a bit of percussion. There's bongos. 
There's congas that were recorded and overdubbed. There's photographs of them in the studio doing that together. There's maracas. And Bonzo's playing little tidbits here and there as like little complimentary things to what's happening with the theremin and, and this trip out section. So um, he's also hitting the gong with his stick, which I didn't realize until I heard the um, the isolated tracks. And I thought, that's not a symbol. That's got to be the gong. So I'll give you an example. So in this section, he's doing this. Okay, something like that. And then at one point he's going. Right? Um, he's also doing a little something like this. I think at one point he goes. Um, and then some little rough type things okay so when we get into that section oh and I forgot one one little thing that I like a lot is when he does this little And that's just simply a cross stick. So, yeah, when we get into the Charleston bit, you know, where the guitar solos come in, the bomb, bomb, I call that the Charleston because it's like a Charleston beat. Um, when he played this live, uh, he played, I believe he played this. But in the studio, especially um, Audible, if you listen to the isolated track again, you can hear snare drum notes in between those Charleston hits. So I'm not sure if he was playing the floor tom or if he's doing it all on the snare. But when he comes out of that fill, this fill. You can hear that in there. So who knows if he's going... Or is he going? Either one, either way, it sounds great and it works and you can do whatever you want, really. But as far as like really analyzing what he did, to play that, it, it just adds more texture. You know, like that's that's the thing is Bonzo's drumming also always has a lot of texture to it. And there's much more texture in than... So I just wanted to uh, point that out, bring that up. Now, after that bit, we get back into the, um, you know, the, the first groove on the, on the uh, opening verses. Uh, let's see. There's some really nice fills in there. And on the isolated tracks, you can hear Bonzo shouting, as he always did when he was playing. He was just, like, yelling out like a bear, as he said. You know, so he'd be playing like um. <laughs> Those, that kind of thing. <laughs> so if I'm doing that, that's a little bit, you know, maybe corny because I'm not him. But but he did do that. And often when I'm playing, no matter what the genre, if I'm playing, it's getting kind of, you know, heated up. I'll just yell or I'll just like grunt or I'll just shout. It just sort of a lot of drummers do that. Elvin Jones did that. Art Blakey did that. I mean, I'm sure there's just so many drummers do that. It's just a very visceral and from the gut type uh, thing you know to do to give your playing extra feeling I guess so um, yeah there's some big fills like that and 
if you're interested in seeing my covers of these songs, I have cover versions of every song on the album th that are on my channel. And uh, you can find them just by searching in my in my playlists or in my on my channel for each song. So let's move on now to the next number. OK, so next up is what is and what should never be. And this tune really does exemplify the whole light and shade type thing. Um, it starts out with this really nice bass line, this melodic kind of uh, lyrical jazzy type bass line from John Paul Jones and uh, Jimmy's sort of strumming these jazzy sort of chords and Bonzo plays it accordingly, very dynamically. He's um, It really shows off how uh, much of a dynamic drummer he could be. And um, I'll just demonstrate the beat that he plays and then it leads into the, um, you know, the louder section. Basically, that's it. It alternates between those two types of grooves until you get to the end of the song. So, so you've got this kind of thing. Okay, um, now the, the the groove that he plays when he starts playing on the snare has a similarity in the feeling to me of Whole Lot of Love because it has that kind of lightly swung feel, which is this kind of thing. So you've got that... has that sway that swagger to it and um let's see then we get to the uh section where jimmy plays the 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 chords that alternate you know stereo and bonzo hits the gong right and then we get into that last section which is this So again, the beat has that, that kind of bounce to it and a lot of ghosting with the snare drum and the hi-hat on um, all beats. Which adds, again, so much texture to the sound and the feeling of the drum groove. It's not just playing straight like... I mean, that's perfectly fine, but not as much uh, character to it. You know, who knows? Maybe Mitch Mitchell, if he were playing this, he would have played. <laughs> right? Or maybe if Ginger Baker were playing it, he might play something like... I don't know, just a thought. Anyway, that's what is and what should never be. Um, okay, so up next is the Lemon Song. And the Lemon Song is basically Zeppelin's arrangement of 
Howlin' Wolf's Killin' Floor, which was a favorite of Jimi Hendrix, and Zepp played it quite a bit on the first couple tours in 1969, and it evolved into this arrangement, which they recorded on the second album. Um, the song is basically just a long-form blues, and Bonzo, again, is playing uh, a beat that has a kind of a swing to it. The feel is not real strict, straight up and down. Um, there's a lot of ghosting, a lot of the, the typical hallmarks of Bonzo's way of playing a beat it, at this tempo. So really, for the first three songs of the album, the, 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 the overall feeling in the beat is very similar, even though the tempos are different. So on this one, we've got... Um, this is basically the groove that he plays on it. There's quite a bit of those type fills in this song, which are classic Bonzo, you know, figures. He likes that figure a lot, you know. So those are triplets with the left hand lead. He plays quite a few of those throughout the course of that song. Sorry, my gong is going nuts here. I might have to put a blanket on it or something. Um, and uh, this song is interesting because it, it goes between basically two different tempos, and they're not exactly subdivided. So you've got the slower groove section, and then you've got the kill and floor, more classic, you know, and that's at a faster tempo. And the way Bonzo sets that up is like this. I think he's actually on the ride symbol at that point. So quarters on the snare drum with the bass drum notes in between. Uh, and then back to the, uh, the, the slower tempo. Again, that's one little thing, but right there, those are the kind of subtle details that make it sound so much cooler. He's playing some ghost notes in between those hi hat, those figures where it, where it goes, but don't, don't, do don't. That's like, which again, it adds texture rather than just going, you know. I mean, you could you could play anything you want there to catch those figures. Right? But the way Bonzo does it, it has that kind of grease in there.
you know, the beat, the beat should always have that, uh, you know, soul, funk, R&B kind of feeling in it. It's not heavy metal. A lot of times people say, oh, Led Zeppelin II, the first heavy metal record, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's not a heavy metal feeling to me at all. It's more like a heavy blues, heavy funk, heavy soul kind of feeling. So basically, that's that's um, Killing Floor. That's the Lemon Song. So let's move on now to the next one. Okay, so next up we have Thank You, which is also another light and shade tune. And um, basically the drumming is pretty straightforward. There's quite a bit of signature bonzo fills throughout the song, but um, mostly it's uh, pretty straight up and down groove and Actually, Bonzo sings background vocals on this track, so uh, that's him harmonizing with Robert Plant. So um, but I'll just play like the first bit of the song and the basic groove just to get a feel for it. This next fill he plays to set up the next section is really nice. Um, this goes something like this. tangled up here playing underneath the mic anyway that's that's basically the style of drumming on the song and um it's just got a really nice laid back feel uh there's some other really nice fills uh throughout the song you know that kind of stuff and uh yeah that's a nice end to side one Let's flip the record over and get started with Heartbreaker now. Now, Heartbreaker opens the second side up with a kick-ass riff that's one of my favorites of all time. And Bonzo's beat on this has that swagger again. It's got that slightly swung feel in it. Um, I'll just go ahead and play the beginning of the song for, for the example. Okay, so there you have um, quite a bit of ghosting going on, and then especially between those hits with the guitar figures, you know, ding dun ding dun ding dun He's playing some left-hand ghosting that, again, adds a lot of texture. So if you want to play this with that kind of feeling, you've got to catch those little details. This This thing right here. Okay, and also the beat has that, that kind of feel to it, you know. He, he actually plays a couple little 
double quick double strokes with the foot there um, at the at the beginning near the beginning. Also, it sounds like there's some sort of delay on the hi hat, which you don't hear on the isolated drum track. You just hear this. You don't hear that that kind of feeling in there. That was some studio magic of Jimmy's. Um, so yeah, and then leading up to the break for the guitar solo, there's a little bit of uh, signature footwork and a different groove, you know. And then again, going back out on the end of the guitar solo, um, a double time groove like this. So Heartbreaker goes immediately into Live and Love and Mate, of course. And um, Live and Love and Mate is a bit of a funny tune for hardcore Zep fans because I think a lot of people don't like the tune. I mean, it is a little bit of a kind of a fluffy uh, pop type, Yardbirds type tune. I wonder if they were thinking they needed to have something like a Mickey Most style hit, you know, single for, for the album. But um, that being said, I actually really like this tune. I, I, I like a lot of things about it. I like the fact that it's played, the guitar riff is played on a 12 string. Um, there's some slide guitar on it with a wah wah. Uh, Bonzo's drumming is really cool. Um, so I know it's not a Zep favorite. I know the band didn't really care for it much at all, and I don't believe ever played it live uh, unless they were joking around. But uh, the beat basically is like a typical, I think, a typical 60s, you know, British pop rock and roll type tune. So you've got um, immediately at the end of Heartbreaker, you know, with the... basically all there is to the tune um you know there's a couple little bits here and there where he changes up the groove um but it does alternate between that half time and double time beat and there's really not much more to say about that tune um other than the bass drum part sounds like he's not always playing the same thing like sometimes i hear and sometimes I hear.
that's basically the tune. So um, let's move on to the next one, which is Ramble On. Okay, so now's the time. The time is now for Ramble On. Uh, PFOZ is about to drop our uh, video of Ramble On very soon. It's, it's pretty much done. And I don't want to give away the, the way I did the tapping part um, just yet. So I'm going to just say that as far as the tapping section of the song goes, there's, there's a, a few different theories out there and none of which have been ever uh, confirmed. Uh, some people claim that it's Bonzo tapping his fingers on a guitar case or sticks on a guitar case or sticks on a drum seat or fingers on a waste bin, a rubber waste bin. Um, who knows? Uh, it's definitely not tapping on his, his lap, though, um, because if you listen to the isolated drum track, the tapping sound has a lot more of a kind of a hollow sound to it, which could be, you know, just because they, there's reverb that's added. But it does sound like sticks or something fairly hard hitting something that has some tone, a little bit of tone to it. But on the final recording, um, excuse me, on the final recording, the that hollowness is not really so prevalent. Uh, it just it sounds it, it does almost sound like it's you know tapping on on a on his thigh or on a drum seat maybe or something rubber. But uh, at any rate, this is such an incredible uh, groove on this tune. I I think that this is a great example of Bonzo's unique approach to coming up with a drum beat. Uh, once again, that fits the riff or the melody of the song perfectly. So this is the drum beat that he plays on the song. Okay, so that beat is, um, there's a lot of ghosting in there, and there's uh, the interaction between the bass drum and the snare drum. So with each of those downbeat accents on the snare, there's a little ghost note after them. Like that. And also the snare drum is catching, is, is in tandem with the bass drum in those parts of the phrase where it's anticipated. So you've got this going. It's not just, the snare drum is in there as well. So that's pop it, um, pop it, um, pop it. Then you've got <laughs> and no, I don't think Bonzo was playing the tapping and then playing the drums. That's clearly too too difficult to make that transition from one to the other so that's an overdub um but that's that's basically uh the main groove of the song and as the song goes out he plays a beat that's similar to what he will play on gallows pole as it goes out which is a snare drum on the downbeats and bass drum figures in between like this <laughs> So 
that's basically the um, end of the song. So Ramble On's a quick one to, to cover. Uh, one of my favorites, though, uh, especially from the early years. So um, now we're going to take a look at Moby Dick and mainly at the uh, main groove and some of the key elements of the song. Okay, so now we come to the great white whale, Moby Dick. And um, the way Bonzo plays this on the studio version is somewhat different in the groove. Um, it's, it's fairly different, actually, than the way he played it later on live. Um, it kind of evolved into something a little different groove-wise with uh, ride, the bell of the ride cymbal. But early on, he would play the, um, the ride pattern on the cowbell, and there's a lot of ghosting going on, and it's a very swung type of beat, again, in the uh, main groove. So I'm going to break it down just a little bit so we could just look at specifically what he's playing in that main groove. I'm not going to do an entire breakdown of the solo right now because um, actually I intend to do a video covering the solo pretty much note for note. And um, that's actually the last song of all the Zeppelin studio recordings that I have yet to cover. I've done every single song from every album except for Moby Dick. And uh, so I need to get around to that soon. I'd like to do that sometime soon. Um, I haven't done everything off of like all of the studio sessions, like outtakes and stuff like, you know, 10 carats and an iPod or whatever it's called. Um, but uh, Moby Dick is the last official release studio song that I have yet to cover. But let's take a look at this groove right now. So the hi-hat, as we are all very familiar with, has a ching ring, uh, tambourine mounted on it. Um, at that time, I don't know if he was actually using a ching ring or maybe a tambourine because there's a photo from one of those sessions uh, for the second album where you can see a tambourine on the floor kind of near his hi-hat. Um, but at any rate, he's clearly playing the cowbell and the beat goes something like this. It really mirrors the riff of the song. So the beat is kind of like, like um, I'll just play it. and so on. Now, um, in the solo, he's doing a lot of work with his hands and playing um, a lot of triplet combinations that are all alternating with flams, like this kind of thing. I'm going to have to move the mic out of the way a little bit. So like... Okay, um, and then there's also some bits where he's using double strokes on the bass drum quite a bit, like this. So those are 
those are just simply left, right, and then two, two bass drum. All right, and um, let's see, as far as the snare drum work goes, you know, this solo is made up of a lot of different solo bits that he played in the studio and they were actually because they were touring um it wasn't like it was a through a, a played through drum solo and then it just made it on the record there's a lot of editing i think they chose a lot of different parts from other solos that he had played there's a lot of on youtube you can find some video posts of um his solo that was um it's more extended it's like outtakes basically and those are really interesting to hear i think somebody even did like a compilation where they put together a more complete solo from the studio sessions for moby dick but um you know there are certain key things that he plays that are pretty iconic um when he picks up the sticks you know you've got the <laughs> And that's the left right double foot thing just in different combinations okay um, and then we get of course into the massive triplets Back to the groove out. So that's Moby Dick. Now, um, I'm just going to go back to this groove a little bit and talk about it because um, it's, it's, it's got a lot that's going on with the ghosting. So, for example, it starts out like this. very much a feel and a texture thing and it's not always the same pattern but there is a lot of that filling up of the spaces with the ghost notes so if you really slow it down and have that um, swing kind of sensibility and feeling in it 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 sounds kind of like a, a New Orleans funk type groove So often play um, kind of like on good times, bad times, he would play little patterns on the cowbell, not just straight eight, uh, 16th notes or eighth notes. I've just been playing straight, straight um, eighth notes for now, but um, he often would play. That kind of thing. And that's the same, goes for the same with uh, when he would play it on the bell of the, the ride, too. So, 
So that's basically Moby Dick, the main groove and some of the elements of the solo. Like I said, I will be doing a, a, a Moby Dick cover full on note for note very soon. So let's move on to the last song on the album, Bring It On Home. Okay, so for the final number of the album, we have Bring It On Home. And Bring It On Home is basically Willie Dixon's uh, song that Sonny Boy Williamson II had recorded back in the 60s. And they used that as basically the introduction. So it's sort of an homage which they did not credit as for at first, but um, eventually they did credit it properly to Willie Dixon. And um, so, but the second half of the song is completely original uh, riff that's very distinctively Zeppelin and the way Bonzo plays that beat is really great. He catches some of the accents with cymbal crashes and it's a fairly busy kind of beat for Bonzo. He's playing a lot on this one. And if you've ever heard the, um, bonus version that's on the expanded Led Zeppelin II edition, which has a, kind of like a rehearsal take of it. Bonzo is just going completely, you know, ape on it. He's just exploding, playing all these great fills, and it's like a little drum feature for him. And actually, PFOZ did a cover of Bring It On Home last year, and it's based more along the lines of that one. So. I can post a, a little link to that one or a card here to, if you want to check it out. But um, So f I'm just going to play this groove a little bit, and um, it may not be necessarily exactly in the order with all the fills and everything, but, but basically the groove is, is this. groove um, which follows the riff along the da 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 is this. <laughs> So that's the basic groove for Bring It On Home, and that concludes Led Zeppelin's iconic second album. I'm really enjoying doing these videos, and I'm already looking forward to doing the next one. It's kind of like a way of virtually hanging out and just talking about what I love so much about these records and Bonzo's incredible contribution to the music of Zeppelin. So... Uh, hope everybody is staying well and enjoying summer and look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thanks again for watching. Peace.